I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the Sumitro Chair for Southeast Asia Studies at the uh, Center for Strategic International Studies. And I'm really honored to, uh, to have you all here for the launch of the US-Philippine Strategic Initiative. I'd like to thank, in particular, our guests uh, for this evening's dialogue and, and launch, uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, Albert Del Rosario, uh, who's flown all the way from the Philippines uh, for the launch. And, and to, we really appreciate your support, sir. And a uh, good friend and uh, one of the leaders here at CSIS on, on strategy, uh, sec former Senator and Secretary of Defense, uh, William Cohen. Thank you uh, for joining us, Mr. Secretary. We, uh, you know, I, I thought today was going to be just a fantastic, you know, <laughs> day where we would talk about the, the critical uh, new energy uh, in the alliance, uh, in the U.S.-Philippine alliance, modernizing that alliance. Um, and I thought that, um, and we are going to do that. Uh, but I thought that one of the areas that we would be emphasizing was, was trade and, and TPA. Um, but for those of you who haven't read your wire service, uh, TPA just splattered on Capitol Hill. So uh, I have to, I was revising and amending my remarks as we, uh, we came up to the, to the podium. But I think we all have to hope that um, perhaps the Philippines can give us some, uh, a boost uh, in thinking about our, our politics and on trade and, and get those straight. But we're here today to, to really look at uh, one of the crucial uh, alliances uh, of the United States anywhere in the world and certainly in Asia, and that's the U.S.-Philippine alliance. And I think the, um, uh, we really were encouraged uh, and inspired by a visit last year uh, from our, our colleagues at the Albert Del Rosario Institute, which is a new think tank uh, in Manila that's been uh, built by Dindo Manhit and his colleagues and the Philippines, uh, Philippines Inc. that's chaired by uh, Tony Boy Kohanko. Uh, these guys came to the United States last year, and they, they came with a group of uh, Philippine CEOs. And they basically said, look, we are private sector leaders, uh, businesses, uh, newspapers, uh, civil society organizations, but we have a broader interest than just coming on a trade mission. We want to come to the United States because we want to understand uh, where this alliance is headed. We think we have an investment not only in, um, in commercial and economic growth, but in, in security. Um, and, that, and I think they, they understood the linkage between economic engagement and security. And I think that's, that's something we've been talking about at CSIS for a long time, that economics, I think particularly in Asia, is the foundation of, of security. So it really rang a, a bell and, and a chord, and we agreed uh, to, uh, to um, uh, form a new initiative called the US-Philippine Strategic Initiative with the, with the great support and encouragement of um, uh, Secretary Del Rosario, Ambassador Quisha, uh, um, our ambassador in Manila, uh, uh, and the, the leadership at, at State Department and the White House all thought it was a good idea. So we have, uh, we have welcomed the eminent persons group back here. Uh, they're here uh, this week, uh, my colleagues from Manila. Uh, we're doing a, a set of meetings uh, over the course of the week many of them with uh, Secretary Del Rosario, who's here for the first two days of the, uh, the launch of the initiative. And what we wanted to do this afternoon was just talk a little bit about what's going on in this relationship, what we should be looking at. Uh, I wanted to, I, I'll ask uh, both of our uh, experts uh, and, and these great leaders uh, today a couple questions about what their perspectives are. And then I'll open it up to, uh, I, I see in this audience, we've got an incredible amount of um, uh, depth and, and expertise on the Philippines. So I'll open it up to some of your questions and we'll wrap up within an hour and then we'll have a reception uh, and, and celebrate uh, this great new initiative. But maybe if I could start with you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you have, uh, by all accounts, been a, a real leader uh, in terms of uh, speaking out for uh, the Philippines' right to uh, self-defense, uh, your sovereignty as a country. Um, how do you look at the U.S. relationship, the, the U.S.-Philippine alliance, in that context, context of your effort uh, to promote um, the security and national, national security of the Philippines? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ernie. I'm um, very happy to be here and uh, with uh, 
former Secretary Cohen. Uh, it's good to see you, sir. Uh, we are, uh, when Ernie uh, calls, I jump. Uh, when he asks me to jump, I say, how high? And, uh, and we have this, uh, this uh, I have this great respect for Ernie that uh, stems from uh, the many years that I spent here in D.C. I was uh, posted in uh, Washington for five years. Uh, at the end of my term, I was fired. Now, I don't know whether Ernie had anything to do with that, but uh, he's smiling. Uh, but er Ernie uh, was a very valuable resource for me. Uh, initially, uh, he was uh, president of the USSCN Business Council. And uh, so he, when he speaks of uh, economic linkages, uh, he obviously, obviously knows what he's talking about. Um, Ernie was uh, my mentor, and he's now become my tormentor. <laughs> uh, but uh, I continue to, uh, to uh, use uh, Ernie uh, as he uses me. Uh, we are great friends, and uh, we, uh, it's, uh, I think the, uh, the alliance uh, between uh, the Philippines and the United States uh, starts with the people-to-people -people links, like Ernie's and myself, and of course you folks. Uh, we are, uh, we only have one treaty ally, as you know, and uh, so we have to like one another. Uh, we have no choice. Uh, we also have uh, two, so far, two strate strategic partners, one of which is the United States. And uh, so the, the, uh, the, the linkage is, is very strong. Uh, we are, for example, in terms of, uh, of uh, a, a relationship, a working relationship, uh, the U.S. is, uh, is our uh, number, one, number one trading partner, number one, number three tra trading partner, number three trading partner. Uh, number two uh, in terms of uh, tourism, is it? Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's number one trading partner. Uh, number three in terms of tourism after, uh, after uh, China and Korea. And, uh, of course, uh, you are our number one uh, provider of uh, official development assistance in terms of grants. So uh, very strong there. Uh, the investments uh, have been, uh, FDIs last year were uh, very healthy. Uh, as I said, number one in terms of uh, investments coming into the Philippines. Um, in terms of uh, defense and security, uh, as a treaty ally, uh, we have uh, relied heavily on the United States for a uh, uh, for a partnership uh, in terms, especially uh, we were, for example, uh, focused inwards uh, in terms of addressing our uh, um, um, the challenges of uh, of uh, insurgency, uh, but now we've. Uh, we think that uh, we have uh, insurgency uh, pretty much under control, and uh, we have uh, now focused on uh, external threats. Uh, the military is uh, is on a modernization mode, and the U.S. obviously is uh, great assistance in in terms of getting us to where we want uh, we want to be. Uh, of course, we could use more and more help from. Uh, from the United States, and that's why I'm here. Uh, we uh, we're trying to get more help uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, challenges that we currently face. Uh, as you probably all know, we've got this uh, huge challenge, uh, which is now, now the uh, South China Sea, and specifically the uh, uh, the uh, uh, massive reclamation uh, that's um, being undertaken by China. Uh, and this massive reclamation uh, by China is, uh, is uh, being utilized to, uh, to, uh, to uh, define uh, 
their to define and enforce their uh, uh, their nine dash line, which is uh, unlawful, as you know. And uh, we are taking the position that uh, uh, we must do something quickly, uh, lest uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, massive reclamation results in. Uh, de facto control by China of the South China Sea. Uh, why is that such a worry for us? Uh, it's, a, it's a real problem because uh, the, if we allow this uh, massive reclamation to continue and for, the, uh, the, uh, you, for China to be able to, uh, uh, to seize uh, full control of the South China Sea, then we, we have the problems in terms of uh, the threat of uh, of uh, militarization, we have the threat of uh, of uh, uh, threat to the rule of law and uh, also a threat threats to the freedom of navigation. Uh, so um, we're here uh, actually to see uh, what uh, what more the uh, U.S. and the and the Philippine partnership can can uh, can undertake. In terms of uh, halting this uh, this uh, siege of uh, of China, in terms of uh, taking as uh, much of the uh, South China Sea as as possible, but um, we all, oh I I wanted to mention also that uh, we do have uh, uh, the. Um, uh, the Asia pivot or Asia rebalance to Asia. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is a combination of uh, providing assistance to the Asia Pacific in terms of uh, not only of defense and security, but also, as Ernie had mentioned, uh, strengthening the, uh, the economic uh, uh, aspects of uh, the relationship. Uh, unfortunately, as, uh, as we have just learned, uh, the the fast track legislation uh, did not uh, materialize today, and we hope that uh, there can be another shot at it. Because TPP, uh, even as we're not on board yet, and we hope to be on board uh, when it does finally come around, uh, we we believe that uh, the uh, economic aspect of the relationship uh, and the is, is in combination with the defense and security, and that is the the total partnership. That's what what that's what it's all about. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, we we are trying to deliver the message that the um, that the Asia pivot is uh, is not as uh, as focused and as um, as. Uh, um, um, as strong as, as, as it should be and uh, we are providing inputs for the United States in terms of how, how this can be further strengthened. So um, I don't know what else you want me to say Ernie but oh, uh, I think that's I, plenty. I appreciate that. I, I'd like to get Secretary Cohen's take on this. You know you I think you started going to the Philippines uh, early in your career, and, uh, and, and I wondered if you could sort of put it in, sure. put these remarks in U.S. Well, context. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary and Ernie. Thank you for uh, the, this gathering. Um, I first went, well, you were saying that uh, you have few friends. Uh, actually, that's not true. Um, you, can, you can't pick your relatives, but you can pick your friends. And we have chosen to pick each other. <laughs> uh, and I remember the first CODEL I went on, a uh, brand new freshman member of Congress back in 1973. And uh, one of the, the very first stops we made in the Philippines. And uh, I uh, had not made a trip like that before and had colleagues, Congressman Tom Railsback and, and others. And we went into the hotel, checked our bags, and went down to the restaurant slash bar. Uh, and I remember there was this beautiful Filipino woman singing, I left my heart in San Francisco. <laughs> and she sang it with such exquisiteness. And I said, wow. And I went up to thank her for the way she, um, she sang it. She didn't speak a word of English. 
And I said, how was she able to sing that song the way she sung that song without speaking English? And I learned music really is uh, the, uh, the language of the, uh, of the universe. Uh, but it uh, opened uh, my eyes uh, to um, the Philippines in terms of meeting the people for the first time. And I used to be a basketball player, and so when Railsback and I saw some kids playing basketball, we jumped out of our, our car, took off our jackets, and stripped down to our t-shirts, and started playing basketball. And so it was the people-to-people -people relationship that we found was really so fundamental uh, to the U.S.-Philippine uh, uh, connection. And it's something that has stayed with me uh, during my own career in politics. Uh, and, and I say this uh, a little self-servingly, my, my wife had written a play, it has written a play that has been playing locally and elsewhere around the country. And it takes place in a place called memory, where you only exist if someone thinks about you. Uh, and that to me is more than the play, it's about everything. Uh, you only exist if we think about you. And we look back now and you say, well, Two-thirds of the people in the Philippines were born since the Yellow Revolution. Uh, more than half the American born since the Yellow Revolution. So we don't have a history for the most, we don't think about the past. And if you don't think about the past, it doesn't exist, which becomes really critical in terms of why it's important that we maintain these people-to-people -people relationships that we remind the American people, Filipino people, of our history together and what it means in going forward. And so over the years, I have been very much involved. I was working with Dick Lugar, uh, who helped uh, bring about uh, the uh, democracy uh, in terms of the relationship uh, with the United States. Um, President um, uh, Marcos uh, was uh, there in 73. Uh, we've had a, a democracy since that time. And we lost uh, uh, Cubic, uh, Subic Bay, rather, and, and Clark. And I remember when we were trying to reestablish a status of visiting forces agreement, uh, I was asked to go to a hotel, uh, MacArthur, where he stayed, and they uh, invited, I had 12 members of the Senate, the Philippine Senate, in a room. I said, I haven't that many senators when I was in the Senate. <laughs> but I was trying to persuade them of the value of having this, this visiting forces agreement. Because of the history, because of the resentment, because um, uh, a democracy didn't want to feel that it had a status of forces that were permanent. So they had to be visiting, uh, and the, the sensitivities in dealing with that was really important. And we've made a lot of progress since that time because things have changed. Um, things have changed in the um, uh, Asia Pacific uh, region in its entirety. And Mr. Greenberg, who is, was a co-chair of uh, this, uh, uh, I believe, uh, relate, uh, this uh, relationship that we're having right now, as far as the study and visiting. Uh, he and I um, co-chaired, and Ernie was very much involved in it, the uh, ASEAN study. Yeah. And we uh, said, why should we be concerned about what's going on in the Asia Pacific region? Well, 50% of the population is in the Asia Pacific region. That's where much of the wealth is going to be for the foreseeable future in the Asia Pacific region. That's where there's also great potential for um, instability in that region. So we have a real interest, a real self-interest in being engaged in the Asia Pacific region. And being engaged, and this is what's so disappointing about it, being engaged, you know, we talk about hard power, soft power, then it became smart power, right? Uh, we want to be smart about how we do things. And that means having a very uh, vigorous trade relationship because with a prosperity comes a burgeoning middle class and growing uh, investment and prosperity. Uh, and that's what's so disappointing what's taken place on Capitol Hill. Uh, Sam Nunn, who's very much engaged uh, here at uh, CSIS, and is a great friend of mine, he gave a speech here one time. He said, he talked about leadership. He said, you know, if you think you're a leader and you stay, 
cutting a path and you're walking down that path, you take a look around and there's nobody behind you, he says, you're not a leader, you're just taking a walk. And that's, to me, what is taking place right now in this city. Hmm. It's a real leadership issue that we have that we're not following something that's in our vital self-interest. We're not following the president on this issue. And the consequence of seeing this rejected, or at least postponed, yeah. for another vote, is very consequential for us because other people, certainly in the Philippines, but certainly throughout the Asia-Pacific region, are looking at us. They say, what's going on? You know, I like to go around the world, and I do, promoting uh, the values of the United States saying, we want you to be like Mike. Right? We want you to be like us. And other countries say, well, be like you, but you can't make a decision. We have this agreement we've been negotiating all of this time. It comes to the Senate, and you can't make a decision on it. So how do we hold that flag up that we like to promote called liberty, democracy, capitalism, when in fact we're not seeing decisions being made which are in our vital interests and that of our partners. And that's what the Philippines, our partner. And so you look to us and say, gee, this was gonna be great. We were thinking of joining in on this. This is gonna be vital for us as we look to this new pivot. You don't use the word pivot anymore. It's called rebalancing. As we rebalance our force structure as such and our um, assets and our influence in the Asia Pacific region. This is key to that. And so when Capitol Hill rejects that and the president has lost that initiative as a result of that rejection, other people are watching and they're making decisions and calculations. So that's why it's vital that we're here today. That's why it's vital to talk to the business community, to political leaders. That's why it's important to get up to Capitol Hill. When I think about this, I go to the Pentagon from time to time just to uh, attend functions. And a young man stopped me when, in the swearing in of the new Secretary of Defense. Uh, and a young sailor escorted me to my seat. He said, what's your name? I said, Bill Cohen. He said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from the state of Maine. He said, well, what are you doing down here? And I thought to myself, <laughs> He was only two years old when I was there. And that's the point I'm trying to get at. There is no memory that lasts very long unless you reinforce it. So we've really got to work to reinforce this relationship and to reinforce the need for this relationship on a security basis to be sure, but on an economic basis. And so uh, I wanted to be here, thanks to Ernie inviting me just to say a few words about how important uh, I feel this friendship is, uh, and a co-equal partnership this is. Uh, and we need to remind people on the Hill, in the Philippines, and elsewhere why it's important that democracies really do work together. Uh, that as we look at this rebalancing, what has the president done? Something pretty important. We look at what's going on in Darwin, put a thousand Marines in, in Darwin, not a shift in the balance of power. We look at rotating littoral combat ships through uh, uh, Singapore. We look at the strengthening of our relationship with the Philippines, Japan, et cetera. What is that designed to do? It's designed to make sure that no one power dominates the region. And we're doing it in a way that we say to the Chinese, we're not trying to contain you, you can't be contained. But we are trying to say to you that we have this relationship of democracies that we intend to continue and strengthen them so that as your economic power grows, and it's significant in economic power, as your military power grows, it's fully integrated into the international norm. That's why this relationship is so important. So I feel a senatorial speech coming on, <laughs> and I'm gonna cease and desist here and, um, and earn well, I want to. I wanna ask you, I wanna ask you both about uh, EDCA. This is the uh, Enhanced uh, Defense Cooperation Agreement. Um, this is an agreement that the Philippines and the Americans together uh, put together. They, they crafted it together. It's now been uh, hung up in, in the Philippines Supreme Court for a year. You said you were in, in Manila Hotel you know, working on uh, uh, visiting forces agreement. But it seems to me that, and, and one of our interlocutors uh, during the 
some of the meetings we've had over the last couple of days suggested, and I think he, he was right, that you know, the EDCA, if you think about it, is probably the best, it, it's something we built together, and it's probably the most effective actual deterrent to Chinese aggression on the South China Sea that you could think of. Uh, it, it actually would, you think of what it would do to President Obama's trip uh, when he visits the Manila in November, if he could come and he's uh, working with the Philippines on uh, providing defense material, support, uh, and, and in places that the Philippines has picked around the country. Uh, and think about, the, think about that picture if he comes to Manila in November, he doesn't have that agreement and it's still hanging out in the Supreme Court. I wonder if I could ask you to put your defense secretary hat on, you know, and, and, and take a cut at that, and then, well, just, Mr. Secretary, I'd love your perspective on this. Just that. think about this. Poll taken, Pew uh, poll said 92 percent of the Filipino people have a high opinion of the United States. That's 10 percent higher than Americans have of the United States. And so you say, how, how does this? How do you adjust? How do you balance this? Filipino people understand this, really admire the United States. We have an agreement that's been negotiated. Right. It's hung up a year later. So we have to ask what's going on because this becomes critical. If you have an enhanced defense um, relationship, then what does that mean? Well, we're going to have greater investment, uh, more um, a sharing of uh, technology, more um, exercises, joint uh, uh, exercises taking place. All of this combined with the weight of the United States and with the participation of the uh, Philippine military, what's, what's the problem? I don't understand it. So I think it's kind of, it, it's very important that this be uh, ratified or approved by the Supreme uh, Court as such. And if it doesn't, it's going to be another uh, indication that perhaps you know, we really don't have it together over here or over there. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the wrong kind of signal to be sending to anybody right now. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, you had a hand in negotiating that pact. Well, uh, EDCA is, um, just to be sure, is a, uh, it's a very important component of our uh, defense uh, treaty alliance with uh, the United States. It provides uh, a twofold uh, service. Uh, one is, uh, it uh, provides for uh, construction of, uh, of uh, new facilities uh, or use of facilities of existing uh, AFP uh, controlled or owned uh, uh, facilities. Uh, it also provides for a, uh, a uh, pre um, uh, Pre-positioning. Pre Pre-positioning of, uh, of this equipment, uh, which of course is, is, is very important when uh, you're able to uh, find a uh, situation where you need uh, equipment right away that, uh, that would be useful in terms of uh, the performance of your mission. Um, the, um, As a benefit, Ed, EDCA is, uh, is uh, obviously uh, uh, beneficial for interoperability, uh, the idea of uh, being able to work together. Uh, it's, uh, it's important for the uh, modernization of uh, the armed forces of the Philippines. Uh, it's important for uh, uh, disaster uh, response. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's built in for for a closer cooperation without uh, uh, without uh, going into a what you call basing, which of course is not allowed by our constitution. It uh, is a uh, also a uh, uh, currently as, as as you know it's it's tied up in the Supreme Court. But uh, we have every confidence that uh, the uh, provisions, uh, the constitutionality of the provisions is not in question here. What's in question is whether it is in fact a, uh, 
uh, a, an agreement or a treaty, in which case, uh, if it's an executive agreement, uh, immediately it, uh, it, 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 you can proceed uh, utilizing it, whereas if it's a treaty, then it must undergo uh, Senate ratification. Um, the, um, EDCA is, um, is, is, is there. Uh, we are already, it's been signed by the President. Uh, we are already working on, uh, on the uh, uh, various locations uh, that may be uh, utilized jointly. So it's, uh, it's moving forward even as it uh, is undergoing a process in the Supreme Court. Well, I, I sure hope that mm. uh, that agreement is signed when the President uh, arrives in Manila, because it, it sure would make a difference, I think. Um, one of the questions that I had was about uh, your arbitration, uh, your arbitrational case that you uh, brought, uh, uh, questioning the Chinese uh, Nine Dash Line uh, in the South China Sea, and I and I wondered if you could tell us, you know, how do you make the decision to to take that case uh, to the court, and and where are we now in that process? When do you expect a, the the court might give you a decision? If you can comment on that. Well, our arbitration was a um, was a, as a result of a very uh, difficult and uh, um, long process for us. It, we we had this uh, dispute with uh, with China on the South China Sea, and uh, we uh, we tried uh, every possible avenue to try to resolve it peacefully as uh, as we needed to do. Uh, the, the the president to begin with uh, is is uh, mandated by the constitution to defend what is ours, and when this uh, South China Sea disputes uh, began uh, and there were uh, uh, this, this, this is driven by the nine dash line, which of course is is not valid and is uh, uh, against the uh, the uh, UNCLOS and international law. Uh, we needed to to uh, look for a uh, dispute settlement mechanism uh, that would uh, be perfectly uh, tailored for what we were looking for. We wanted to defend what is ours. We needed to do it peacefully. We needed to do it uh, uh, in such a way so that uh, the international community accepts uh, the uh, the settlement. Uh, Procedure as a as a friendly, uh, durable, and uh, clearly a, a legal uh, a legal decision. Uh, so we um, we selected the uh, arbitration uh, and the method of arbitration that uh, was chosen did not require China to participate. Uh, so this was. Uh, I think a wise move on our part because in the end of the day, China decided not to participate. And even at this time, uh, they, uh, they are uh, uh, not, not, uh, not convinced that they should be part of it. We continue to invite them, even at this late stage, uh, China, uh, there's an invitation out there for China to join in, uh, and they refuse to do so. Uh, what's happened, though, is that uh, there is a uh, uh, there was a um, uh, uh, a um, paper that was put out by China, uh, and this is uh, uh, prior to 20, 26 questions that we received from the arbitral tribunal, uh, which we had to respond to. Um, and I think uh, it took us a couple of thousand pages to respond to these 26 questions. Uh, but when the uh, tribunal saw the, uh, the paper that China had put out, uh, initially they thought that uh, uh, we would try to pursue a, a procedure in the tribunal where the juris jurisdiction plus the merits would be taken as one. Uh, but when they saw this paper to give China a, uh, its, its fair day in court, uh, we, the, the tribunal decided that uh, they would bifurcate 
the procedure. Uh, and uh, but that, that's okay with us. Uh, uh, we we uh, we think that it may take a little bit longer, but uh, the tribunal assures us that uh, uh, it's not going to be much longer because a lot of the information has already been submitted. So uh, we are uh, we're scheduling a uh, oral hearings uh, for the. Uh, jurisdiction by July and then a little bit later for the uh, merits of the case. But we hope to have a, uh, a judgment uh, sometime uh, perhaps early 2016. Okay, so that you, you hope to have an, uh, an, award. an award before elections? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, that's uh, we're reasonably certain of that. You, uh, Secretary Coney, I know you spend a lot of time in Beijing and have got a lot of Chinese friends. What, what do you think China wants? I mean, what is what is China intending to do uh, in the South China Sea? And any recommendations <laughs> for the U.S.-Philippine alliance? You want me to read the Chinese <laughs> mind? Uh, uh, look, China, two years ago, I was at a conference in Singapore. Uh, it's called IISS uh, and uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies. They have a conference every year uh, in Singapore and one in Bahrain uh, in about December. Two years ago, I went to the, uh, the conference and foreign minister of one of the countries there took out a map and showed the nine dash line, but it was solid. It wasn't dash, it was solid. And he said, what do you think about this? And I said, I said, I've never seen it solidified like that. And he said, no, the problem is, what are you saying about, not me, but what is the United States saying about that? And the answer was, we weren't saying anything. And so I said, well, if this goes, they wanted me, obviously, to raise this. It was uh, Chuck Hagel was uh, Secretary at that point, mm -hmm. to raise this to uh, Secretary of Defense's level, say it's about, it's important the United States speak out about this because otherwise everyone just going to assume it's now filled in. That is the line. And it's no longer a question of in being in dispute. Uh, and so thank you for uh, you know, seeking at least some way of, of having some uh, decision making on this. But I think from the Chinese point of view, uh, you know, I, I admire what the Chinese people have done. I went there in 1978 and it was a different country. Beijing was a very different place than, than it is now. Uh, they had one hotel called the, it was still called the Peking Hotel at that time, before it became Beijing. Uh, they had uh, one store where we could shop uh, as Americans. Uh, it was called the American Friendship Store. And they had no cars. It was all bicycles. So think about it, in 35 years time, what they've been able to achieve. So it's pretty remarkable. On the one hand, very admirable and a little bit intimidating. You say, if you could take 1.2 billion people in that short a period of time and make that kind of a transformation, that's pretty, uh, number one, awe-inspiring and also intimidating. So what do the Chinese feel? They feel that um, they have made um, uh, a number of sacrifices to build their economy. They're now uh, the number one, they will be the number one economy uh, in the world, or number two at least in terms of overall um, uh, uh, capability, but they're going to be a, a regional military power. They intend to assert their military prowess throughout the Asia-Pacific region, and uh, maybe even beyond that. And I think it's something that has been in the making for some time. Uh, I met Deng Xiaoping back in 78. He explained his four modernizations. The fourth one was military, because and I've argued this to the uh, Chinese uh, military academies. I went over, at one point they were writing white papers coming out of China saying it's time for the Asians to take care of Asia. Time for the United States to get out. And I went to their academies and I said, do you really mean that? You want us to leave? The fact of the matter is that by virtue of our presence since World War II, we have maintained stability and peace, and guess what? Who's been the biggest beneficiary? China. Because of stability, you've been allowed to develop in a way that has made you the economic powerhouse you are today. Now, if we leave tomorrow, which is what the white paper was saying, who fills the gap? Nature abhors a gap. 
And who's going to fill it? Are you going to fill it? Are the Japanese going to sit on the sidelines and watch you fill it? Will India sit over here and say it's not our problem? And you would have great instability if we were to leave, as you're suggesting. And I think they realize that. But I also think they're going to continue to push as far and as much and as hard as they can until they see a resistance to say, no, we understand you're going to get bigger and stronger. That's inevitable. 1.2 billion people, 3 billion people, that's going to be inevitable. Stronger military to reinforce their economic power. That's just the way of the world. On the other hand, if we have these relationships that I mentioned before, and say to the Chinese, we understand uh, that you're a great country with a great history, uh, and that you're going to get bigger and stronger, and your military is going to get bigger and stronger, but it needs to be folded into the international regime. Otherwise, you're going to meet a very strong resistance coming from Australia, from the ASEAN countries, from Japan, uh, and elsewhere uh, to say, no, we want you to be uh, engaged in peacekeeping operations. We want you to work with us on all of the host of these issues that confront all of us, from the climate change and what that's doing to the world and humanitarian rescue missions, et cetera, et cetera. We want you to be engaged in those measures, and we understand there's going to be some tension, but you're now going to confront a variety of democratic countries who have come together to say we want you to be uh, certainly peaceful. So their intentions, I think, if they go unchallenged, like anything else, they'll continue to expand. And that's why we were talking about before, with this signal coming from Washington is they watch us very closely. And by the way, there's the old expression that amateurs study policy, experts study budgets, right? And they're looking at our budget and what's been happening to the American budget. We've had this cliff that we've gone over and had sequestration. Now, we've had a little bit of relief in the last two years, but sequestration is there in 2016. What does that mean for our military? What does that mean for our rebalancing? What does it mean for the security of all of our friends and partners in the Asia Pacific region? Start cutting back. Well, how many ships? Uh, what kind of presence are you going to have? How much rotation are you coming through uh, back here in Subic, et cetera? So that's why we have to get our house in order, certainly economically, but politically understanding the role that the United States is going to play in this century. Because we don't know right now. We don't know what our role is in this changing world. And that's not a good place for us to be when we're not sending a signal that we know what our role is, we know what we have to do, we have to remain engaged, we can't retrench, we can't come back to a continental cocoon. We're not going to walk away from the world because the world's not going to walk away from us. So we have to be forwardly, we have to be out there. And uh, until that, and that hasn't been resolved yet, frankly, we're still debating ever since. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera, Syria, Ukraine, all the issues going on. Putin now wanting to have a nice dialogue with you, with Secretary Kerry. We've got to come back and say, who are we? And what's our role in the world? And look at the people who are relying upon us. And what do they see? Do they see constancy? Do they see a strong trumpet? Or do they see one that's hesitant and uneven? So we've got a lot of work to do. I'm, yeah. I'm, no, I'm, I'm getting back on my senatorial actually, I, uh, stage here. I was just wondering whether you might want to go back to the Senate. Uh, we, could well, sure, for, we could sure use For a that. moment. Yeah. Um, no, we, your leadership there was fantastic, and we need more people like you there, I think. Uh, let me open it up to uh, some questions from the audience. And I think we've got about 10 minutes left. We'll start with this gentleman right here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Paolo von Schirach, uh, editor of the Schirach Report. Uh, Senator, Secretary of Defense, uh, you were talking about memories and things that we forgot. I, am, I do remember when, uh, under the Reagan, during the Reagan administration, we had a 600 fleet Navy, right? At least as a plan. Not as a reality. It was a plan. It was an was Sec aspiration. The Secretary of the Navy wanted the 600 ship Navy. Exactly. Was, uh, but, but we were, but the numbers, let's say, were quite higher. 
That's right. So 600 was a goal. We never got to that, and let's call it aspirational. Now we're what, under 200? I forgot the exact number. And as we are talking about uh, the, you know, the rebalancing, et cetera, and you, you alluded to that in some of your comments, do we have what it takes to uh, effectively convince everybody, ourselves, the allies, and the Chinese, given what's been uh, eloquently described, that we have what it takes to have an effective rebalance, considering also that the strategic mission of the Chinese Navy is interdiction, not, you know, they don't need to go to Hawaii, they just need to control their backwaters, there. and our mission is much more uh, expansive and complicated with such reduced numbers. Can we do this? Thank you. Would you like? <laughs> I don't think anyone else here can answer that question. Uh, well, you know, I, I hate to take so much time in responding to something. Uh, it's an important question. Do we have uh, what it takes? Um, There's the old expression once again that quantity uh, has a quality of its own. And we know that we're shrinking our numbers, they're more capable. That's a, that's a given to it. The technology that we have on one ship today far exceeds any capability you'd have uh, on a uh, ship that has you know, 6,000 uh, sailors on board. But you can only reduce the numbers so, so small. Uh, and the absence of presence has its own consequence. Whether you could say militarily we can get there, we can get there with long-range bombers. We can get there with ICBM. We can do all of that from here. That may be true. It's not true right now. But it might be true sometime in the future. But the problem is other countries won't trust you that you'll come for them. I mean, one of the, one of the cruel uh, truths that we have is we are forward deployed for a reason. Because if we have troops that are forward deployed, they're at risk. And if our troops are at risk, we're going to come. And that's another signal to other countries saying, hey, you're leaving. You're not here as much as you were. Uh, and when you leave, we can't know for sure whether you'll be with us. So any country is going to look for its own self-interest and start to make its own you know, calculations. Can we rely upon the United States? That's what's going on now with this whole Iran discussion, isn't it? That's why the Middle East countries, the, the Gulf countries are coming here saying, OK, what's the deal? What's the deal going to be? Uh, tell me the specifics. And assuming that I even can like the specifics, tell me whether they're enforceable, one. And if they're enforceable, are you going to be there to help enforce them? And number three, what's the compensation you're going to provide us in the meantime so we can help defend ourselves? It's, it's a question of trust, because they see, wait a minute, you're out of Iraq, or sort of back in. You're leaving Afghanistan. You didn't get involved in Syria. You don't get involved in Ukraine. That's, and so we see you kind of disengaging. And it's up to us to explain to the American people why we have to be engaged. We paid a heck of a price for Afghanistan and Iraq. It's almost $2 trillion, not to mention the loss of life and all the suffering we've gone through and the suffering we've inflicted as well. So a big penalty. So people are fatigued over this. So let's just come back and take nation building right here at home. And you've got Republicans saying that as well as Democrats. Let's take care of us here at home. And so you have the issue that we have to take care of. We have the nation built here. We have to start investing in infrastructure. Take a look at the city, the streets in the city of Washington. Talk about infrastructure <laughs> or the bridges, et cetera. So we've got to do that. And we know we've got to fix the national debt. Mike Mullen, our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, what did he say? Number one national security issue is our national debt. It's $18 trillion. OK. We know how to deal with that if we have the will. Now, you had one Republican candidate uh, from New Jersey say, hey, I've got a problem with Social Security. Here's how I'd fix it. We know what has to be done to fix our long-term debt problems. It's just a question, do we have the will or are we going to keep doing what we're doing? Not investing, not engaging, simply squandering the heritage that we have by this kind of bickering that's taking place. Uh, so I don't know if we have the will. I think it's going to take strong leadership certainly coming from the White House, but also from the Congress of the United States, and go out there and explain why it's important that we be engaged uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Tell us why. Well, let's look at the economic benefit, number one. But think about what's going on in the world. Are we going to be a model 
a democratic model for the rest of the world, or is it going to be one of authoritarian governments? There's a real issue of governance in the world today. Can democracies govern themselves and make decisions in their own self-interest? Or is it going to be one where you have a strong ruler who rules by dictate uh, and simply gives you the law of rule, not the rule of law? Let me, uh, let me go to uh, Renee. I'm Renato De Castro, an analyst in the ADR Institute and also faculty member of De La Salle University. My question is addressed to the secretary. Uh, about three weeks ago, a very prominent politician in Manila who have already declared that he want to run for the election next, next year said that when he, you know, just in case he becomes elected, he became, he's elected to office, is open to the possibility of joint development with China. This basically means a 360 degree turn to the current policy of the Aquino administration of challenging China's expensive maritime claim. How would this basically affect our position right now, our current foreign policy, and to a certain degree, our close security relation with the United States? Was his name Pacquiao? Uh, I don't want to mention his name, okay, <laughs> but he's very, uh, you know, yes, a strong presidential yeah, contender. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, when, uh, when uh, people speak of joint development, they normally are referring to the uh, de development of uh, the natural resources found in the South China Sea. Uh, we are not uh, averse to joint development. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we, are, uh, we are promoting joint development, provided it is in conformity with Philippine law and does not violate our constitution. Straightforward answer. Well, I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank both of you uh, for helping us kick off this initiative. I'd like to encourage everybody in this room to be involved in this this initiative. It is going to take uh, this one will truly take a village, several villages, to to make this uh, alliance uh, vibrant and stronger to stronger in three years than it is today. And I have to thank uh, uh, Secretary Del Rosario for your inspiration yeah. and your leadership. I want to thank Secretary Cohen for his, uh, his stalwart uh, support of uh, CSIS in general, but particularly Asia. You've really been a, a leader who will step up, and, and we are behind you when you take a walk. So uh, uh, I really want to thank both of you gentlemen. I want to just say a little bit about... Ernie, okay. I, would you one last comment, yes, if sir. I may be given that privilege? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there was a question that was asked uh, previously. Uh, uh, and the secretary responded uh, that uh, uh, China wanted to be a, uh, a naval power. Uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's evident. Uh, they want to be a uh, naval power, and uh, they look upon uh, uh, the South China Sea as their lake. Uh, I think uh, w the message that I want to leave today is uh, we have this problem in the Ch South China Sea. And uh, I read something today uh, which perfectly aligns in my thinking to this, the, the author that, uh, that provided uh, this paper that uh, I enjoyed thoroughly today. Uh, it said that um, essentially that uh, um, um, the most important uh, dispute uh, today is the South China Sea issue. Now, why did the author say that? Because uh, the author sees that uh, the U.S. and China uh, have goals uh, that are diametrically opposed. And uh, the outcome of uh, of uh, this is of this contest uh, is capable of determining the international order. Very significant statement. Think about it, and I leave you with that message. That's the last word. Thank you.